This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash ev9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. It's time to say goodbye to hold music and say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away. All while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at salesforce.com slash products slash service. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance. Deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Clavio. Learn more at Clavio.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash Spotify. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Want to advance your career or switch fields? An MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business can help. Earn your degree from a top-ranked business school with a thought-provoking curriculum, one-on-one leadership coaching, support from experienced career counselors, and full-time online hybrid and accelerated MBA formats. Join the intelligent future. Visit cmu.edu slash Tepper to learn more. Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Raphael Crawford Marks about creating a culture of appreciation in your organization. Raphael Crawford Marks, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you today. You're joining us from Colorado. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about creating a culture of appreciation in our organizations. We're going to explore the role of compensation, total compensation, um, and how that can impact uh, our motivations, how that can impact things like retention, but get beyond that kind of carrot and stick mentality and, and really get into that culture of appreciation that we can foster uh, within our organizations. As we get started, I wanted to share Raphael's bio with everybody. Raphael Crawford Marks is the founder and CEO of Bonusly, an enterprise platform that helps companies create high performance, high engagement workplaces. He founded the company as a side project in 2012 because he believed that there was a better way to facilitate peer to peer recognition and appreciation. He grew Bonusly to the point where he was able to leave his job as a developer to work on the company full-time. And today, Bonusly serves thousands of customers around the world. Uh, f- wonderful story, a, a wonderful 10-year adventure 
um, that you've had. I'm excited to pick your brain and learn more about what you're doing. Before we dive on into the conversation, anything else you would like to share with me or the audience by way of your background or personal context? I think you covered it. Uh, That was great. Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, let's dive right on in. I've already explained a little bit about Bonusly, um, but feel free to just add a little bit to that, um, including a little bit of the journey of starting it, uh, why you started this company, Mm -hmm. um, and how you transitioned away from your your day job to doing this full time. And then we'll start to talk more specifically about the nuts and bolts of, you know, really that culture of appreciation. Yeah, the the impetus behind starting Bonusly, and and I started working on it as a side project. So really, thinking it was it was what what was so interesting about this sort of space and this idea that I wanted to give up my my nights and weekends uh, to to build it. And th- the reason was this: I was at that point, um, you know, fifteen years into my career, um, having worked primarily as a software engineer at a, a number of different companies. And I, I knew, or I believed that uh, people and the teams they formed were the primary determinants of the the outcomes that companies realized. It seemed to me to be obvious that if a company wanted to be successful, it needed to find a way to unlock the full potential of their people and teams. And, uh, with that belief as sort of the foundation, I then looked around and saw in my own experience at companies I worked with, hearing from friends in a wide variety of different roles in different industries, it really seemed like companies were behaving in ways that were often often sort of puzzlingly antithetical to their interest in getting the, the best performance out of their people and thus the best business results. And so I thought, hey, like, maybe things are going to have to change, you know, as companies, you know, some leading edge companies will start to get the idea that they should um, run their companies in ways that create better performance and enable better performance. And those companies will win out and the other, other companies will have to either change their practices or, or they'll be competed out of existence. And maybe software can be something that helps companies adopt a lot of these best practices. Uh, software will never be a panacea. There's always, you know, many aspects to forming yeah. culture, but there are a lot of things that can be done in software, especially as technology more and more often uh, mediates our working interactions. There's a lot, there's a role for software to play in, in enabling performance and enabling a, a culture of appreciation. Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. Yeah, I well, I love all that. You're really speaking my language. <laughs> all of that I think is so so important, and it really is you know mind boggling. I have these types of conversations with with executives and business leaders, thought leaders like you from around the gro- globe all the time, right? And a lot of times we talk around these issues, um, and I, and we're in large level of agreement. Yet there are so many leaders out there. There are so many organizational executives. Um, who just don't seem to quite get it. And that's, I guess, why there's a niche mm-hmm. for people like us um, to do the type mm-hmm. of work that we do. Um, it seems so obvious to us, yet it's, it's, it's something that still does, doesn't happen in a lot of organizations. And, and I think even with well-meaning leaders in many organizations who get it and, and they buy into the, the framing that you just laid out, um, the systems, the processes, uh, you know, the, the mechanisms within their organization kind of push them a different direction. And it takes a really resilient leader who's willing to challenge the status quo often to be able to get past the murkiness of, you know, their, their, the systematic issues that they may be butting their head up against to really get to the point where they can do some of the types of things we talk about. So I think it's just really fun as, as you're, you're talking with your business about how you create a platform to specifically help. So you're, you're, you're focusing on not just culture stuff um, generally, like lots of people talk about the importance of culture, but you're, you've created a mechanism, a system to help in 
perpetuating and, and sustaining the type of culture that you need to have and helping leaders um, who may not fully get it or not fully buy in to start d- down that path. And for those leaders who do get it to have the systems in place to support them and doing what they already want to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think what we're up against and, and the reason why there are still, I would say probably the vast majority of, of yeah. uh, corporate leaders are not fully bought into this is because um changing hearts and minds is often a operates on a generational time scale yeah, yeah. um it's it's a slow process and and i can tell you, you know, i've been doing this for 10 years there are heads of hr who laughed at me when i pitched what you know what bonusly was and did 10 years ago some of whom who are now customers of bonusly so right. the, the minds are being changed this is the direction that we're going in but you know, from the dawn of the modern corporation, um, companies and leaders of companies have thought of uh, employees as coin-operated machines. You, know, you talk about sort of the carrot and stick mentality. I like to talk about the coin-operated machine mentality, but really it's like sort of, I want them to do a job. I'm going to pay them whatever, you know, the market requires to get them to do the job and, and Bob's your uncle, I should be done. It's, it's that simple. Now, we know from psychology that it's not that simple at all, that human beings are not coin-operated machines, and that uh, there is there is always a gap between sort of the minimum amount of work an employee will do to keep their job and the full potential of what they could be doing. Right. And if you're paying a fair wage, you're probably most of the time going to guarantee that you're getting well, that, that minimum amount to keep their job, but there's an enormous gap between that minimum amount and getting the full potential of that employee. And that's where uh, often sort of softer, fuzzier things need to be done and softer, fuzzier investments need to be made to create an environment where that discretionary effort is going to be put forth, um, which is often the difference between winning and losing for your company. Yeah, there's so much research on employee satisfaction, employee engagement, um, and, and leveraging the motiv- the intrinsic motivations of employees to help them maximize their potential, like you've been discussing. That's not to set aside the importance of extrinsic factors and extrinsic motivators mm-hmm. and things like compensation still are important. You know, sometimes I, I, cringe when I, I, you know, some leaders will, will listen to something like we're, what we're saying, and then they'll say, oh, good. So I don't need to focus on compensation. And so then they go back to their people and they're like, they use that as an excuse to not pay people well or equitably uh, or to recognize Mm -hmm. their efforts via um, traditional compensation mechanisms. Those are important. People need those. And especially depending on age and life stage, you know, sometimes it's more important to some people than others. Um, But the reality is, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the research behind that? You know, the role that compensation plays in attracting and retaining good employees, because it it plays an important role, but it's not the end goal either uh, to get us where we want to be. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think the best way to think of compensation is as hygiene. Uh, So um, if you never shower, you're going to suffer some pretty negative consequences in your ability to be successful in your life. Um, But once you're showering once a day, you're not going to become more successful by showering 10 times a day. Uh, and so compensation is the same way. If you don't pay a fair wage, and I think an important nuance here is you actually get more benefits from fair compensation when uh, your employee base perceives that they are being paid fairly. So I know a lot of companies are very against these like pay transparency laws, but actually laws that that communicate to employees that they're being paid fairly um, gives you more bang for your compensation buck. Uh, so it's something for, for companies to think about there. But there is this hygiene condition of you have to pay fairly. Uh, if you don't, then you're going to suffer really negative consequences of not being able to retain or hire you know, anyone. Um, but once you're paying fairly, paying more does not deliver many benefits at all. Uh, the, the returns diminish to almost zero very rapidly once you're paying above 
a fair a fair market wage. So uh, at that point, you're paying a fair market wage. You're going to attract high quality talent. People will see that on a sort of economic basis, this is a company I want to work for. The question is then, how do I best onboard and motivate and retain these employees for the long term? Because your employees, most of them, and certainly all of the best of them, will have many options of places to go where they can also get a fair wage. And uh, most of us uh, know uh, that we spend tens of thousands of hours. I think it's something like 80,000 hours during our adult life working. The only thing we spend more time doing is sleeping. And we all know that you can make more money, but you can't make more time. So one of the things that people really crave is spending those working hours doing something that fills them with a sense of purpose, a sense of progress, a sense of belonging, um, something that we sort of put under this umbrella term of feeling a sense of appreciation, which is me means, I think, to be sort of fully understood and seen as having worth. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to foster that sense of appreciation at work. All of that is super important to, to keep in mind. And again, we, we're not trying to suggest that you don't pay people fairly, equitably, you know, whenever possible, you know, I'm always an advocate for paying people better, paying people well, a living wage, mm -hmm. not just market, but above market, et cetera. Like all that's really important, um, you know, and people want to be treated fairly. And so if they feel like they're not being valued by the organization, that's going to cause all sorts of resentment and, and demotivation, et cetera. Um, but to your point, it's a hygiene factor and it's not something that's going to push them usually past, um, you know, or, or into rather the, the higher levels of engagement uh, and, and productivity and innovation. Uh, so getting into those other aspects, the intrinsic aspects are going to be really, really vital. So what you're focusing on in your business is that um, appreciation component. Tell us a little bit more about creating a culture of appreciation and even describe a little bit about how you help to, uh, organizations to do that via bonusly. Yeah, absolutely. So for, first, I'll start with just some, some research on the matter um, that I think is really interesting. So um, th there's a, a paper published in 2018 that found that 79% um, of voluntary quits cited uh, a lack of appreciation as a key factor. Um, but there was a really interesting disconnect where company management and leadership um, believed that uh, uh, the majority of quits were due to compensation. Whereas uh, the people actually quitting were saying it wasn't due to compensation, it was due to this lack of appreciation. So there remains this disconnect over what is driving people to quit. And obviously, losing a valued employee is extremely costly. You have a gap on your team, you have to spend resources to recruit and train and hire up a new person, you have um, you know, domain expertise and sort of tribal knowledge walking out the door. That is all very very costly. So what we focus on at Bonusly is um, providing essentially a turnkey solution to create a number of different conditions that promote a feeling of appreciation at work. So I, I think the, the one we started with, it's still sort of the foundation of Bonusly is uh, recognition. Um, companies do do a lot of uh, recognition programs. I think something like 80 or 90% of companies have at least one recognition program. Most of those programs are, are not effective. Uh, yeah. To have an effective recognition program, the recognition needs to be timely and frequent. It needs to be specific and, and personal. Um, it needs to be inclusive of all your employees. Uh, and, and it needs to be tied to your company's core values and mission. Because um, again, you know, one of the things that really motivates employees is feeling that sense of purpose, which is often tied to a belief in the values and mission and vision of the company. Uh, the, the other things that, that Bonusly does is makes those, those recognitions visible. And because employees are participating regularly in Bonusly, we're able to not only share wins, but also engage, for example, managers to see what their direct reports are doing. Because we know that relationship between managers and direct reports is one of the most impactful in an organization. 
Um, in fact, 70% of employee performance and variation in employee engagement is explained by manager quality. So a lot of what Bonusly also tries to do is strengthen, uh, create opportunities for strengthening that relationship between manager and employee. The, the last thing Bonusly does is there is a room for not just appreciation and, and sort of post hoc recognition, but there is room for incentives for contingent motivators in certain mm-hmm. settings. Mm-hmm. Um, if there are specific trainings that employees need to do or specific, you know, sort of uh, uh, very clear specific goals that, that employees need to complete, or if you want to incent certain behavior changes, that is also something that Bonusly can do very well, whether it's a, a wellness incentive to get people moving, healthier employees or happier at work, whether it's sort of learning and development incentives to complete different learning and development uh, modules. You know, those do have uh, an important place and Bonusly does you know, have uh, create an environment where those can be done very quickly and easily and, and efficiently. Yeah, excellent. And again, I appreciate the focus on on both types of motivators and factors in helping people to feel appreciated. Um, and to to bring it back to the compensation piece or the bonus piece, um, some of those other contingent types of um, compensation or monetary types of factors. You know, just in my own organization at the the university, I'm you know I'm a professor and. And we had an issue um, in my department. I'm a chair. And so, you know, I have a whole bunch of faculty that I'm working with, um, trying to help them, you know, be happy and satisfied and productive. And, and one of my most, mm-hmm. very most productive employees, uh, the very most productive faculty members, a great teacher, great researcher is involved in so much other, you know, service and activities, committees at the university and such, um, there, there has been an issue the last couple of weeks um, around frustrations around uh, pay and, and equity and, and some of those sorts of things and just feeling valued, period, um, mm-hmm. by the university. Um, and one of the things that this individual was pursuing, uh, you know, unfortunately, it kind of went up the line and it, administration said no, and it came back down. So um, yesterday I was having some of those hard conversations um, and then also trying to figure out what else can I do? You know, the university just said no to this one thing that this person was asking for, but there are other mechanisms. There are other, other ways, even monetary ways, um, just not the one that this person was seeking. And so, you know, yeah. now it, it, it's, it's incumbent upon me as the leader to, to try to be creative around how um, I can help this faculty member feel valued to feel recognized mm-hmm. to help them understand that they that they are a, a top contributor and that we want them to continue to be a top contributor right um and so there's a lot of ways to go about doing that you don't necessarily mm-hmm. need uh you know a software or a system to to help you do that but the vast majority of people don't know how to do it and so and so having having exactly. a system in place will really really help you you know part of the yeah. conversations I was having yesterday, some with this faculty member, but also a lot with my dean's office, the admin, the upper administration at the university, because it's not something they were thinking about. Like they they just yep. saw it as you know this compliance thing or this policy thing. They weren't seeing the human side of it and how this was impacting the mm-hmm. the the faculty member. And it wasn't until I raised questions and issues and started to explore some creative approaches that, you know, they kind of got it and they're like, oh, I, I see why this might be important. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, there, there's not always someone like me there to try to push people yeah. in that direction. And so, so 100%. Having, having mechanisms are really going to help. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I mean, that is such a great example of the power of, of, you know, having a, a great manager, or I don't know if you're officially this person's manager, but having someone in that sort of you know, managerial type relationship who can be an advocate for an employee. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure you know people. I I certainly know people who um, who stay in jobs because they have a great manager, even if like the they disagree with decisions from the corporate higher ups. Like having having a great manager can um, 
you know, can really make a big difference just as much as having, having a poor manager can make a sort of a Mm -hmm. negative difference there. And you're absolutely right from, uh, you know, management skills to also just understanding how to sort of foster a culture of appreciation. These are things that are not taught. And because the, the history of the corporation is one of this coin operated machine mindset, there mm-hmm. isn't industry knowledge that gets passed down from, you know, leaders to their, their, um, uh, you know, direct reports who then become the next generation of leaders on, on why it's important to think of these things and, and what the different tools in the toolbox are. So that's something we're also trying to change both by baking as much of that into the product yeah. as possible. So it's super easy and sort of it's available to you out of the box, but also by training everyone at our company who interfaces with our customers to be educators as well and educate the the people we talk to in marketing and sales, as well as mm-hmm. educate our current customers about what they can be doing, how they can be best be using our product and also how they can best shape other company policies to, to support their, their employees and get, get good outcomes for their employees and for the business. Yeah. Very well said, Raphael. It has been a pleasure. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a couple minutes, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience, how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team at Bonusly, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, Bonusly is uh, bonusly.com, uh, spelled exactly like how it sounds. Uh, we would love to talk to you. We produce a lot of content on our blog, and um, I can be found on, on LinkedIn if anyone wants to uh, connect with me directly. Um, and as a last word, I, I would say that one of the things I love, probably the main thing that I love about working on Bonusly and building Bonusly and why I'm still doing it 10 plus years later is because it truly does deliver a win-win. It just feels really good. Um, companies and employers win, employees win. It's, uh, it's really great to find those opportunities to, to, to have win-wins for everyone. And so we'd love to, to you know, meet more companies and, and show them the possibilities of creating more win-win situations for their teams. Yeah, wonderful. Raphael, thank you again. It's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Raphael and his team at Bonusly can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.